thank you all for joining us. Welcome and thanks for joining us for National Pollinator Week. My name is Kathy Land. I'm the Sustainable Cleveland Manager for the City of Cleveland Mayor's Office of Sustainability. And I'd like to start with just a few housekeeping notes. First, we ask that everyone mute themselves except the speaker. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat box. We're also asking that you let us know where you're from. Uh, Lara Rakatenens, who is the Ohio State Coordinator for Pollinator Partnership, will be monitoring the chat box for us today. Thank you. Um, I've asked each of the presenters to keep their presentations to 10 minutes so that we have time for questions. If they do go over, I might have to break in. Sorry, guys. Because <laughs> um, I hope that we can be done by 1230. Uh, we will send out resources afterwards for a follow-up. There's also been a suggestion to post the presentations on a blog, so I'll let you know where to find that. Uh, video today is optional, except for the speakers. And lastly, I think and I, I hope that we're all getting a little bit more familiar with this online platform, but just in case we experience a hiccup, I just ask for your patience and understanding while we work it out and all learn how to, to live in this new world. So National Pollinator Week is this week starting June 22nd to June 28th. This is a designation by Pollinator Partnership, and National Pollinator Week is a time to celebrate pollinators and spread the word about what you can do to protect them. So that's what we're doing right now. Um, I will be introducing the speakers, um, then after 10 minutes, we'll have a short Q&A, uh, and then we'll go on to the next speaker. We're going to start this morning with Amber Barnes, who is the wildlife conservation ecologist with Pollinator Partnership. And she is going to talk to us today about Project Wingspan. Amber, if you'd like to share your screen. Hey, Kathy. Yes. We've had a request that you speak up a little bit when you're speaking, so just for the future. Okay, thank you. Fortunately, I won't be speaking much. I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> All right. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. I sincerely hope you and your loved ones are safe and well during these uncertain times. Uh, thank you, Kathy and Sustainable Cleveland Office for inviting me to join this webinar as a presenter. Um, so, here we go. As Kathy said, my name is Amber Barnes and I'm a wildlife conservation ecologist and program coordinator for Pollinator Partnership. And I have the pleasure of giving you a brief overview about Project Wingspan and the opportunities this initiative has to offer you, as well as share a little bit about other opportunities to celebrate your pollinating friends during this National Pollinator Week. And uh, as Kathy said, I'm also joined by uh, Lara Rakatenitz, P2 State Coordinator for Project Wingspan in Ohio, who will be assisting with the question and answer period today. So I'm so excited to be speaking with you on this 13th annual Pollinator Week, a time of celebrating the valuable ecosystem services provided by bees, butterflies, birds, bats, and beetles that are needed to sustain a healthy planet and a healthy human population. So if you're hearing this now, you're obviously interested in celebrating Pollinator Week, and there's a number of ways that you can do that this year and into the future. So a few examples are shown here, um, are hosting or attending a Pollinator Week like your event, like you're doing today, 
uh, encouraging your governor to sign a state-specific proclamation in support of the week and its importance, and sharing your love of pollinators through swag and um, creating much needed habitat on the landscape. And pollinator.org is your hub for finding information and resources, including a free Pollinator Week toolkit that we put together every year. And with less in-person activities going on this year, P2 has put additional effort into getting landmarks to change their lighting regime in support of pollinators. We have international commitments from Niagara Falls and the Toronto CN Tower, as well as coverage across the nation, including buildings from Florida to California. And I'm thrilled to share that we've been successful in getting the support of Cleveland's Terminal Tower for the third year in a row. Um, so in this time of physical distancing, we're also working with our partners from the Million Pollinator Garden Challenge to launch a new project to facilitate the sharing of pollinator stories and encourage online celebration of these important pillars of our landscape. And you can also find a variety of tools, programs, and information on our website from technical habitat creation guides and informational brochures to educational programs, working groups, and planting resource. Uh, P2 likely has a program or resource to support you in your goals. And while P2 is a national nonprofit, we have some Ohio specific resources that can help you plan, install, maintain, and interpret your own habitat through our Monarch Wings Across Ohio project. You can also support Monarch programming in Ohio through the specialty license plate. And to learn more about this project and access the free guides, you can visit us at our website on the screen. And we'll be sure to share these links uh, in the follow-up that Kathy mentioned as well. So now that you're aware of some great tools and resources that are available to you through Pollinator Week and beyond, uh, it's time for me to tell you a little bit about Project Wingspan and how we're helping to spread wings and seeds across the Midwest. So Project Wingspan is a three-year large-scale conservation effort under the direction of Pollinator Partnership and fueled by local grassroots actions that are taking place throughout the Great Lakes and Midwest region. Project Wingspan is funded by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and collaborates with a robust team of core and satellite partners in each state. In Ohio, we're partnering with the Ohio Pollinator Habitat Initiative, Holden Forests and Gardens, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Partners for Fish and Wildlife, as well as many other organizations, agencies, institutions, and of course, our wonderful volunteers. The overall goal of Project Wingspan is to increase the quality, quantity, and connectivity of imperiled pollinator habitat areas across the Midwestern and Great Lakes landscape. And our approach is to train volunteers to collect regionally appropriate seed, then have the seed cleaned and inspected, stored, and some diverted to be grown as plants, and then redistribute the seed and plants back to the region of origin while also offering trainings to landowners and managers and securing letters of commitment from folks like you to maintain your pollinator habitat. The native plant species that we're targeting for Project Wingspan are monarch larval host plants and plants that provide high quality pollen and nectar for the monarch butterfly, the rusty patch bumblebee, and other imperiled pollinators. The target plant species were also chosen to provide pollen, and nectar throughout the growing season. Seeds will be collected in bioregions in each of the participating states, and the seed collected in a particular bioregion will be returned to that same, that same state's bioregion. So here's Project Wingspan in a nutshell. We're training volunteers to collect seed and forming them into collection teams. We have provided both in-person and online training opportunities for those interested in becoming a certified seed collection volunteer for Project Wingspan. However, with the current pandemic situation, right now we are only offering the online training option. Through Project Wingspan's online training, participants gain lifelong skills related to native plants by learning plant identification, best management practices of seed collection, data collection protocols, and others. 
And while these skills are critical for the proper stewardship of natural areas through our project, we also hope participants will use these skills in their own lands and apply them to other local conservation efforts they engage within their communities into the future. And seed collection is a fun social event compliant with CDC recommended physical distancing standards that not only teaches great skills, but also develops a deeper connection and understanding of our natural areas. Nature really provides a place for us to escape, reflect, recharge, and find inspiration during tough times. In fact, several of our volunteers have shared with us that this time outdoors helps to melt away some of their stress and also gives them a sense of accomplishment and satisfaction that they're able to help affect real change regarding an issue that they're passionate about. And of course, the health and safety of our volunteers, neighbors, friends, and employees is of the utmost importance to Pollinator Partnership. So with this in mind, we have provided all of our volunteers with some guidance and to ensure that where able, our teams can still actively participate in Project Wingspan with peace of mind during the COVID-19 pandemic. The seed collection teams, um, so the seed collected by teams is then dried and coarsely cleaned, then shipped to Mason State Nursery, a DNR facility in Illinois, to be sorted and further cleaned, temporarily stored, and then grown into plugs. And while all of this is going on, we're seeking individuals, organizations, and agencies with at least five acres of land that are actively or planning to enhance their lands for pollinators and encouraging them to submit their habitat areas into Project Wingspan's Habitat Survey. The Habitat Survey can be found on our website, and there you'll find questions related to your present pollinator habitat situation, as well as questions about your future pollinator habitat enhancement projects. Ultimately, the seed and plants produced are awarded to conservation projects vetted and identified through the Habitat Survey, as well as through project partners. And although not everyone who fills out the Habitat Survey can get awards of seed and plugs, all participants will be provided with information and training resources to assist them in reaching their long-term habitat goals. We had also planned to hold land steward workshops in select states where one could further their understanding of habitat creation, restoration, and enhancement, and long-term management techniques. But to ensure the safety of all participants and adhere to current social gathering limitations, these in-person workshops are currently on hold and may transform into a webinar series, depending on the status of health and safety recommendations in the coming months. So thank you so much for your time and attending this important webinar. We welcome you to join us in our efforts, whether you come aboard with us through Project Wingspan, by attending a workshop, volunteering to collect seed, leading a collection team, offering your land as potential collection location, or enhancing your land for pollinators. Or if you participate in pollinator conservation through other means and organizations, Every action is important and our cumulative efforts will yield real results. To learn more about these programs and how you can get involved, visit pollinator.org and please let us know if you have any questions. So thank you again to Kathy and Sustainable Cleveland for this opportunity and happy Pollinator Week to you all. Thank you, Amber. Uh, so Laura, did we have any questions for Amber or did you have anything you wanted to add? No questions. Oh wait, here's a question from Andrea, just came through. If you don't have five acres, can you still be involved with getting seeds for your yard? All right, thanks Andrea. Um, Laura, do you want me to take that or do you? No, go ahead. Yeah, that's fine. All right. Um, so yes, our uh, the seed and plug distribution will be prioritized for um, larger conservation projects that are, are shovel ready, but we will have numerous um, resources, technical guides, and information available to help those with smaller habitat that are interested in um, enhancing their you know, backyard habitat and things like that. Great. Uh, any other questions, Laura? 
I don't see any other questions that have come up, but I would encourage all of you that are interested to please drop me an email. Again, it's Lara, L-A-R-A, at pollinator.org, and I would be happy to send you more information directly, and we can set up a time to chat further if you're interested in becoming a seed collection volunteer, because I'd love to have you. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Amber. Uh, we're now going to turn over the screen to Peggy Spaeth and John Barber. They are the co-chairs of Friends of Lower Lake, and they are going to bring nature home. Peggy and John. Thank you very much, Kathy, and happy Pollinator Week to everyone. <clears throat> we want to share, <clears throat> share with you this morning our all-volunteer effort that combines ecological restoration. Sorry. <laughs> we can do this, really we can. Okay. That combines ecological restoration with local history just outside of Cleveland, on the east side of Cleveland, where we have a number of initiatives going on, all volunteer, all citizen science. And those initiatives include working together on public space, and then moving into yards, okay. encouraging people to move into yards. Okay. Oh, there it is. Okay. And then <clears throat> going into linking those yards into the Heights Pollinator Pathway. So to start, we formed an all-volunteer group, Restoring Habitat, at Shaker Lower Lake in the Shaker Parklands, formed by a dam put up by the Shaker Colony in the 1830s. The lake is split down the middle by Cleveland Heights and Shaker Heights. And we are working on both sides and working with both cities on our restoration effort. The primary focus is removing invasive plants. We have taken out over 20 species of plants, including most of the invasive plants on Ohio's banned plant list. And we've been working since 2018. In 2018, we started working in a site on the edge of Lower Lake that was completely covered with porcelain berry and Japanese honeysuckle. We began clearing that area out and we inadvertently discovered the rich history of the Shaker Lakes Canoe Club. By July, we had uncovered the concrete foundation of the two-story canoe club. And finally, in November, we were able to unearth the entire foundation and begin taking out invasives around where the building had been. This was a two-story building from about 1907 to 1976. So in addition to the invasive plants brought in by the Shakers, we had close to 70 years of plants planted around Lower Lake by the cities and by the Canoe Club. And so our seed bank is very, very heavily contaminated with invasive plants. Uh, we have a couple pictures of our cheerful volunteers. We are very, very much uh, applied pollinator supporters. Uh, we teach our volunteers about native plants and about removing invasive plants. But the whole focus is on restoring the ecology of the area around Lower Lake and having these people take what they learn home as well as begin growing their own plants. We've continued now, we're in our third year and we are physically distancing while we work removing invasive plants on the shores of Lower Lake in the Shaker Parklands. And we ask people to please come join us Sundays between 10 and 12.30, bring water, bring work gloves and uh, come support our work um, that includes uh, putting in additional habit, uh, pollinator habitat. So that's where we're working in a public space under the auspices of the Donebrook Watershed Partnership. And we've also been gardening in our own yards because in our own yard here in Cleveland Heights. Um, we wanted to live in the metro parks and they wouldn't let us. So we decided to bring the metro parks back to our own yard. And, you know, through self-education and going for walks and 
listening to naturalists and using Newcomb's Wildflower Guide and then, you know, Google Lens and anything we could find to tell us what's what in the metro parks and in other natural areas throughout Ohio, we started to bring some of these plants home. And when we first moved into, oops, sorry. When we first moved into our house, um, we had, this is our house, uh, a row of hostas and lots of grass. And there was um, this uh, Colorado spruce already there and much too big to cut down. So we're living with it. It's good habitat. And uh, so there were four non-native species in our front yard. And um, after, well, this is 2020, so this was last summer. Now we have at least 27 native species, including four native trees, seven different varieties of shrubs, and more. The, our whole tree lawn is now, uh, there's no grass at all. We, we gave the postman our um, electric lawnmower, so nobody's mowing anything around here anymore. One thing I did want to mention about pollinators is that we have a, a lot of different habitats in our little yard. I mean, there's, I just heard recently the term novel ecosystems. I think all of our yards have novel ecosystems from, you know, this square foot to this square foot. This is sunny, this is shady, but this is dry, this is wet, this is, you know, different times of day, it's full sun. So it's always tricky to find the right plant for the right place. And one of the things that I've really um, been focusing on and John, John and I have both been focusing on is more shrubbery. Um, because we're, we're not just, we are of course supporting pollinators, but we're also trying to support all of wildlife, you know, the birds and all of the insects. So we're trying to approach this from a, an ecological point of view. Um, just a disclaimer is that, you know, I have an arts background and John was in banking, so we are pretty much self-taught and, and learning from everybody around us and all of the professionals here today as well. This is our backyard. It was a shady, it's a very shady backyard. There were several mature trees there already. And um, we, we started to get rid of all the grass, hostas, euonymus, trash, English ivy, etc. And we laid down paths for the dog um, along the perimeter because dogs always like to parole patrol the perimeters as they chase the rabbits out of the yard. And um, we've created this um, very shady woodland garden, uh, kind of referencing the fact that uh, Ohio used to be 95% forest and we've, we've built on the overstory layer and then introduced a, an understory layer and shrubs and, um, and then the, the ground layer, trying to create a very diverse habitat. Uh, this was this spring, you know, it takes a while to establish these native gardens and this is the third spring in our yard and everything start, is starting to fill in and come together and, and I'm very, our model is uh, Jackson Field in the Metro Parks and um, this is not, I, I know this is not Jackson Field, but we're starting to get the feel of all of these wonderful spring ephemerals coming up all at the same time and getting this beautiful array of yellows and purples and whites. It's really exciting. Um, then our, we've decided, um, you know, that it's kind of boring to walk down the block at the rest of our street. <laughs> so <laughs> we've tried to infect our neighbors um, on our street on Bradford Road and Cleveland Heights with the concept of trying to get rid of just a little patch of grass and plant some pollinators. So Last year, we started the Bradford Pollinator Path based on our own tree lawn. We encouraged our neighbors to just dig out a very small patch because, you know, people, until, until everybody was laid off and working from home, people were very busy, always, you know, in their car and traveling and going here and there, and they didn't have time to do anything except for mow their lawn. And we didn't want to overwhelm people with the idea of, now you have to plant pollinators. So we suggested on our street alone that people just dig out maybe three square feet of their tree lawn and we encourage them to buy pollinator packs from our local nature center at Shaker Lakes for $20. And then we also got a very cute sign made and I think a lot of people wanted to have a garden so that they could display the sign. It's just beautiful. This one, of course, has the butterfly milkweed growing up right in front of it. How convenient. 
even the kids got involved digging out their lawns and planting and apparently this this young man who's also quite an avid birder has it, well, is insisting that his parents plant nothing but natives now which is just i love to um you know spread the word we planted and and you they will come we saw our neighbors were so excited to see all these different butterflies and bees coming up and down the street. And we're also encouraging people if they don't happen to have a little patch of lawn to plant in containers. I, we had extra plants and we simply put them in containers in a part of our yard that didn't have much going on green wise and the pollinators came there too. So you don't have to, we don't have to think of plants is um, only going to the to the big box garden centers you can just get native plants and put them in containers just as well as you can begonias and fuchsias and all the rest of them one of our neighbors captured this actual flight of the monarch right going down the street above the sign which was quite incredible i love it. it's out of focus and overexposed and it just shows the action of what's going on on the street so actually these are actual photos, unretouched photos of pollinators in our yard. Then people on the adjoining streets, East Fairfax and East Monmouth said, uh, we're a little jealous of what's going on on your street. So we are going to expand the program and a local artist designed the Heights pollinator pathway sign. It's aluminum on both sides and this is um, a, a screen capture of the map that we started to create. As we ask people to please give us your address if you've started a pollinator patch somewhere in your front yard. Um, we're not asking people to display signs if they happen to have a gorgeous native plant garden in the backyard because the whole point of what we're doing is to spread the word. And so if people are walking their dogs or just walking to school or walking down their street, they can see that there is this is this is a native plant this is how it grows this is what it's growing with this is what it's attracting insect wise you, they can watch the caterpillars right on the tree lawn eating munching away on the butterfly milkweed or the swamp milkweed so um, we're trying to spread the word we're propagating seeds ourselves from our own yards and sharing with neighbors and giving plants away and um, you, we have a I can send a link afterwards to this so that you can see that we're, we have gardens, not just in Cleveland Heights, but in Shaker Heights and South Euclid and Lindhurst and Beechwood. Um, we consider anybody who wants to be part of the Heights, you could be part of the Heights. And so far we have over 65 front yard or tree lawn native plant gardens mapped. But just as a reminder, we're not really planting for ourselves. Part of the whole reason we're doing this is to plant for wildlife too often the plants that we find in our nurseries are are pretty and they're cultivars and they're not necessarily good and nutritious for the birds and the insects in our lives so we're trying to put the birds and the insects first by planting a diverse habitat all the way from the trees to the shrubs to the ground layers and attracting them because it's really about the birds and the bees Thank you, Peggy and John. Uh, Laura, or Laura, do we have any questions? We do, and it's a good one. I was gonna ask this myself, actually. So, um, Anne said she loves this idea for all communities. Can you share the sign info, cost, and sign manufacturer? Absolutely. Um, we can, shall we just email you some resources afterwards? Yeah, or you could paste it right in the chat too, and then that way it's easy for Kathy to grab. Whatever's easiest for you guys. I think emailing afterwards rather than finding something on my computer right now. <laughs> yeah, and I'll be sure to put it in the resources we send out. Great. Oh, and Kristen is asking, how do, we, how do they let you know that their yard would want to be a part of this? Uh, we have um, a network of people and email lists and mostly this has been kind of from person to person. So we have team captains on different streets and they've been collecting info, but we can send you again links. We have, we have some resources up on the internet and we're just developing a new website all about um, all of our projects, the height, the Friends of Lower Lake and the Heights Pollinator Pathways and a few other local initiatives for planting natives. So we can send you the links and the resources and 
people just are emailing us and then, you know, we have a personal uh, map that we put things on. Uh, okay, Kristen also says that she lives on Queenston, so that's not too far. <laughs> just down the street. So, um, also, Amber has asked if you are registered in the Million Pollinator Garden Challenge. No. Amber, can you share some extra information with us about that? Absolutely. Um, so I don't want to take over anyone else's time, but we'll make sure to send a, a link for that out with the other follow-ups because Super. these sound like they'd be great additions to the Million Pollinator Garden Challenge. Excellent. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Peggy and John. Thank you. Uh, Just when, real quick, Maria was asking about the pollinator pack of plants. That was through the Nature Center at Shaker Lakes annual plant sale. So that's over for this year. Is that correct, Peggy? That is over for this year. That, um, native plants are a little difficult to, to source. And I would encourage anybody listening today who's an entrepreneur to start a local nursery that's only selling native plants to people because they are hard to find. Um, I know Amy Roskilly can probably speak to her sale that's coming up and she's yeah. going to be selling uh, um, plug packs in for fall planting. I think that Amy you can you can tell them all about that but I do encourage people to plant in the fall. It's just the best time to start a garden. First of all it's nice to be outside but in the soil is usually a little bit moist but also gives the natives any plants really a, a two cool seasons to get established. So um, I would encourage you to connect with Amy. I think she's the next speaker about about her sale. And there are on our resources page that we'll send you the links of there. We have a, a list of some local resources for plants. And um, we do a lot of trading and sharing as well. Okay. Peggy, you're right. I do have those resources um, in my presentation and I will make sure that Kathy Get the links to our sale. Uh, the deadline is July 17th for the fall delivery. So um, make sure all those that all, that all gets out to you very soon. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Uh, we're now going to move on to our next speaker. Uh, Sarah Scott is an entomology graduate student in Mary Gardner's lab at The Ohio State University. And she is going to talk about life in a contaminated habitat. Sarah. All right, thank you so much for that introduction. All right. Um, yeah, uh, as, as uh, was mentioned, my name is Sarah Scott. I am in Mary Gardner's lab and uh, of, most of the research is focused in the Cleveland vacant lot system. So heavy metals have received a lot of media attention as of late ranging from the burning of Notre Dame Cathedral and the subsequent spread of toxic lead dust over the city of Paris to the Flint lead water crisis that's been happening for the past half decade, to heavy metals being found in foods, including baby foods and rice. And recently studies have come out showing the ubiquity of heavy metal contamination all around us. However, heavy metal contamination is not a new issue. Heavy metals are both naturally occurring and byproducts of development. Some sources of heavy metals include uh, smelting and industri steel industrial operations, the combustion of different uh, leaded gasolines, the use of certain paints and pigments, cement and cement dust, uh, vehicle exhaust and wear, the demolition of certain structures, and improper disposal of waste, just to name a few. <clears throat> Additionally, since heavy metals do not naturally biodegrade, once they're introduced into an area, they will remain in that area until they're properly cleaned and removed. Heavy metal contamination is typically higher er, around urban and industrial areas. Where we see major issues with various forms of contamination is in the post-industrial region of the United States. One city within this region is Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland has a history of smelting and steel production. Unfortunately, following the decline of these founding industries, uh, it has experienced a severe decline in population. This has led to an abundance of uh, abandoned houses, which are bulldozed and removed, adding to the 27,000 vacant lots within the city. These vacant lots have a low likelihood of being redeveloped. Unfortunately, traces of the structures that once stood remain as contamination in these lots. Lead is especially present from lead-based paints that were used on the structures that once stood, um, in addition to leaded gasoline when that was still used. While these vacant lots can be perceived as symbols of decline, they also uh, 
can be see, seen as opportunities for renewal and growth. If properly converted, these vacant lots can act as conservation spaces at urban farms and add green space back into human dominated landscapes. Several studies have been published examining the importance of cities for bees. So this makes it even more important for us to understand how contamination within these vacant lots are influencing our urban pollinator communities. So in Cleveland, our lab found 90 different species of bees within the vacant lot system. For this project, I'm focusing specifically on bumblebees. Bumblebees are prolific pollinators that are commonly found within cities. They are social bees that live in colonies from 20 to 400 individuals, depending on what species you're, you're talking about. Uh, and their large body size enables them to fly over really large distances, potentially exposing them to more contamination than some of the smaller species that don't have quite as large of a foraging range. So previous work by a lab wanted to see if bees are in fact getting uh, exposed to these heavy metals and if so at what concentrations. Bumblebee colonies were deployed on an urban to rural gradient uh, in the city of Cleveland. They were allowed to forage for about two weeks, um, then they were collected and dissected and tested to see um, what concentrations of heavy metals, if any, were found. So heavy metals were found in all different life stages, uh, in addition to the collective provisions, that being the honey, um, by the colony. Uh, those concentrations inc increased as, as uh, you moved closer to the city center. So we know that bees are being exposed to these heavy metals, but we're not we're unsure of how these environmentally realistic concentrations are actually affecting overall <clears throat> success of these colonies. So how do heavy metals influence bee success within cities? Heavy metal contamination has been identified as an understudied yet potentially influential factor influencing bee success. So my objective was to look at how these environmentally relevant concentrations of heavy metals influence colony health and reproduction. The, my hypothesis was that the reproductive success of colonies exposed to heavy metals would be reduced. So to do this, we used uh, a tented foraging experiment uh, to expose bumblebee colonies to these environmentally relevant concentrations of heavy metals. Uh, I ran three different tent trials for 15 days each. E the tents that were used were seven by uh, two and a half meters to allow the colonies to fly freely. Um, treatment colonies were fed arsenic, cadmium, chromium, lead, or all of them combined, or no heavy metals to, uh, to serve as controls. All colonies were randomly assigned to a treatment and then deployed um, and um, all conditions remain consistent, all conditions across tents were consistent. Uh, so we used the highest concentration of arsenic, cadmium, chromium, and lead that were found in the bumblebee collected honey from the colonies that were deployed in Cleveland. Each tent had a sugar water feeder with a 50% distilled water to sugar nectar solution with one or all of the heavy metals for the treatment colonies or no heavy metals for the control. All of the tubs were also placed in moats to dissuade ants. Each tent also had honeybee collected pollen that was ground and all feeders were monitored daily and refilled as necessary. At the end of each trial, colonies were recollected, uh, weighed, flash frozen, and the number of eggs, larvae, pupae, and adults were counted in addition to um, honey, honey um, samples were also taken. Each life stage was sorted based on color into living and dead, so we could see the overall effect on brood mortality. So overall, there was no difference in the number of brood um, produced during the duration of these trials um, between either eggs, larvae, or pupae. However, there was a significant difference in the overall uh, brood mortality. So using generalized linear models, <coughs> we compared overall brood mortality, <coughs> excuse me, um, for each trial after 15 days of exposure to these heavy metals. The y-axis shows the treatment and the x-axis here shows the overall percent mortality. Co control colonies fed an uncontaminated sugar solution had about a 25% overall brood mortality at the end of the 15-day trial, brood including both uh, larvae and pupae. However, colonies that were exposed to a single heavy metal um, had significantly higher brood mortality compared to those control hives. And what's more, colonies that were fed all four heavy metals had significantly higher brood mortality compared to both the treatment colonies that were fed just one he single heavy metal um, as well as the control colonies. 
So using odds ratio, we calculated that colonies that were exposed to a single heavy metal had about a four to three to four times higher likelihood of having dead brood compared to co colonies that were not fed any heavy metals. And colonies that were fed all four heavy metals, which is much more reflective of what bees would encounter not foraging in the natural environment, had about a nine times higher likelihood of having dead brood compared to these control colonies. So while these environmentally relevant concentrations of heavy metals are seemingly low, they still had a significant negative effect on overall brood survivorship. So studies have found that brood typically express fewer detoxification genes, which may explain the observed results um, since they would be more sensitive to overall stressors. So revisiting the hypothesis that the reproductive success would be reduced when exposed to heavy metals, it was supported, but not in the way that we thought. So while there's no difference in the number of brood produced, there was a difference in the number of surviving brood. And if we look at fitness as in the number of uh, live bees pr produced for the next generation, there was indeed a decline in surviving brood. So what does this all mean? While foraging in the natural landscape, bees are likely exposed to a myriad of other contaminants in addition to the ones that were tested in this trial. This means that brood survivorship may be lower in natural foraging colonies um, that could lead to long-term population decline. So when developing uh, pollinator habitat, reducing exposure to heavy metals is a challenging obstacle to long-term conservation success that must be, be addressed. So we need to be mindful of the contamination level within a landscape uh, before attracting bees into that area. But knowing that cities are usually contaminated, does this mean that we just shouldn't plant flowers? Not necessarily, we are nowhere close to that. First, we need to understand how bees are being exposed to these heavy metals and coming in contact with these cont this contamination. So we know that certain plant species can uptake certain heavy metals. We plan to look at the potential for common weeds that grow in retro locations um, to see it, what their ability is to uptake these, these uh, heavy metals and concentrate them in their floral resources. Uh, we're in the process of testing nectar that were collected from blooming plants in the uh, vacant lot system of Cleveland and testing those uh, samples for heavy metals. So once we know if these floral resources have heavy metals uh, and vary by species, we can begin to isolate the different exposure. If we do ha find heavy metals in the floral resources, uh, then we work to identify if the heavy metals are taken up through the plant and concentrated in the nectar, or if contaminated dust falls on the leaf surfaces. Once we know these exposure routes, we can then work to reduce overall exposure. With that, uh, I'd like to thank my, my lab and funding sources, um, help over the summer, and we'll take any questions. Thank you, Sarah. And Laura? Do we have any questions for Sarah? We do not have any questions right yet, but maybe give people just a minute. I do have a barking dog, so I'm just gonna mute myself. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we do have a question. Would it be best to first establish plants that are known to absorb heavy metals for a couple of seasons and then plant pollinator habitat? Uh, that's definitely a, a great way to go about it. Thank you for the question. Um, I, I, uh, I think it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword because it is important to remove them from an area, but then doing so in a way that minimizes uh, pollinator exposure during that initial uh, focus. So um, leafy vegetables actually take up quite a, a high amount of heavy metals. So, uh, you know, maybe planting a crop of spinach for a couple of years and then not eating it, of course, um, and disposing it. So there's a lot of different remediation techniques. Unfortunately, most of them are, are pretty expensive, um, but also one positive is heavy metal contamination is also usually pretty spotty. Um, so getting a soil test um, of an area, looking at different patches, um, typically the highest concentration is gonna be found within the first 10 to 20 feet from a roadway, if it's a heavily traveled road, um, and then be less contaminated the further back away from the road you move. Um, and also, if there wasn't a structure there to begin with, then uh, you don't have to worry about the lead paint that was um, on the house. So um, I'd say really testing the soil would be the, the first round um, and then making decisions for soil remediation after that. Okay, so we have a couple questions. Um, what, well, a couple comments. So people love your study and said it was fabulous. So uh, that's exciting and very interesting research. Um, 
Can you share a source of recommended native trees that don't take up heavy metals? And then another question is, would it be best to test the soil to find out if it has heavy metals in it, which I think that you already um, answered with, you know, some home gardens, that's a good idea. But do you have a source of recommended native trees that don't take up heavy metals is a question that we have. Um, not off the top of my, my head, but um, thinking about it, and this is uh, just purely uh, me thinking through the, the process right now, but since tree roots go really deep into the earth, um, I'd imagine that they probably have fewer, um, like take up fewer contaminants since um, the majority of contamination from um, both like air deposition um, is in the first, uh, say like 10 centimeters of soil. Um, and that's, you know, not very, very deep at all. So I think if you had plants where the roots pulled from kind of below that initial Do we still have Sarah? I think Sarah froze. Okay. Uh, why don't we... One more question. Uh, okay. What is the recommended scientific standard testing procedure for heavy metal soil testing? So there are, there are different labs around Ohio and the country that you can go look at their procedures for sampling the soil in your yard and bagging it up and sending it away. Most soil tests are not very expensive, maybe $25 or so. Um, and then there's different types. So you can test for things like your NPK or you can test for things like soil contaminations and those would be different tests. So you just have to look. I know, Kathy, do you know of labs in the area that you um, recommend? No, I wonder if Amy might know of some and also OSU Extension yeah. probably has suggestions. I think the one that I've heard of that does the heavy metal taste testing is called Logan Labs. It's someplace like in Logan, Ohio, so a little bit away from us, but. Yeah, um, we do have a list, actually OSU Extension has a list of soil testing places, but they don't all do lead testing or heavy metals. Um, I wanna say UMass does, but I'm not 100% positive. So before you pick one of those places to send your soil to, make sure you call them. Um, again, with the links we'll send out, I'll make sure that OSU Extension Fact sheet um, is in is included in that, so you all know where to go. Oh, somebody said University of Pennsylvania does, uh, and UMass does lead. Okay, great. So those two, um, and I do have soil test kits to give away that I'm going to be giving away in August. So keep on my good side, people. Okay, thank you, thank you, Sarah. Uh, we're now going to turn it over to Denise Ellsworth. Denise is the Program Director of Pollinator Education for OSU's Department of Entomology, and she is going to talk to us about pollinator education in Ohio. Thank you, Denise. Great. Thanks, Kathy. Hi, everybody. So I feel so lucky because all these great folks who are presenting this morning are um, people I get to work with in different avenues. So I'm with um, Ohio State University through the Department of Entomology, and my main focus is pollinator education. Um, so I wanted to share with you some of the resources that we offer, some of the cool projects happening across the state um, that you may or may not be involved with. Um, so, uh, you know, lots of us have seen the pictures of the rusty patch bumblebee. Uh, we're hunting for this bee, the first uh, bee to be added to the endangered species list in North America, in the continental U.S. Uh, in 2017. We haven't seen it in Ohio, um, and you probably know about the bee team and the effort that uh, Dr. Randy uh, Mitchell and Dr. Karen Goodell undertook for two years, along with their graduate students, undergrads, um, and other scientists to comb the state to try to find out if we had the rusty patch bumblebee. Um, they actually uh, surveyed and identified uh, 30,000 bumblebees across the state. It was a, a non-lethal survey, so they actually saw them on the wing or captured them to identify them and then released all those bumbles. Uh, but one of the avenues they used to uh, expand their study, because of course, even if with a great uh, skilled bee team, you can't get to every corner of the state, uh, they recruited uh, community scientists, and maybe some of you are um, involved in this effort, 
And we created a project on iNaturalist, which is the free platform uh, used globally for lots of different kinds of uh, natural history surveys. And our project is called the Ohio Bee Atlas. And so um, this is a statewide survey that um, a statewide tool that anyone who takes a picture and an observation through iNaturalist and submits that either through their device, your phone, your iPad, or through the computer, um, that bee image um, automatically gets fed into the Ohio Bee Atlas. And so we actually don't have a, um, a species list for Ohio. We don't know how many bees we have, how many species. Uh, we think maybe 400 plus species. Uh, Michigan did a survey a couple years ago. They had 465 species that they identified in Michigan. I'm sure we have 466 at least, right? So um, we're trying to find out what, what are the species that we have in Ohio. So the Ohio Bee Atlas is one tool for that. And you can see this is a screenshot from this last week. Uh, we had almost 17,000 observations that people had made of bees in Ohio and um, 151 species had been identified from those observations. Um, as, as you probably know, it's really tough to identify bees, especially very small bees. Um, for some bees, uh, an image isn't enough. You really have to have the bee in front of you. Um, sometimes you have to observe the, the genitals of the, uh, particularly male bees, and, uh, or the mouth parts of that bee. And so uh, while we can do a lot with images, uh, it's only part of the picture. And I'll come back to um, a way that we're kind of expanding this, um, this survey uh, outreach this year. So basically what we do, uh, we go out in the field, folks can take pictures, they can capture uh, bees in little vials or in Ziploc bags, and eventually it's releasing those bees, but taking some pictures that then are uploaded to, um, to iNaturalist and the Ohio Bee Atlas. So I want to tell you about Lydia. This is a great story. She's a volunteer at the Cincinnati Zoo. Um, they have a group called the Buzz Troop, and the Buzz Troop are teen volunteers who come to the zoo once a week um, in a typical summer, right? Not this summer. Uh, they check out a camera from the horticulture department. They walk through the zoo, which is also a botanical garden. If you haven't been there, it's really incredible. And they take pictures of insects that they see on flowers. Uh, all of their observations are then uploaded to iNaturalist, and they have, um, I think they're number two on the Ohio Bee Atlas for the most observations um, across the state. So a really cool outreach project and um, it's a really approachable tool. It's something that um, people of all ages can use. Um, I have a number of teachers who use iNaturalist in the classroom. Um, it's something that you can do. You have the camera in your back pocket and um, you actually end up with kind of a life list of what you've seen um, through your observations on iNaturalist. So some of what I'm usually doing right now is um, uh, what I'm not doing this summer, right out there in the field, working with folks um, with nets and vials and cameras, observing what we see and submitting those observations to, um, to iNaturalist. And this is in a number of different formats. You can use iNaturalist if you have walks, um, if you have groups that you're leading or um, just as a, an individual community scientist. Um, so again, getting those pictures of bees, those observations um, loaded up to iNaturalist. Um, and getting up close and personal with, uh, with bees. Here I am, if you can just see the little yellow speck on that bee's face between my fingers. Um, so this is a male carpenter bee, obviously, because I'm holding it pretty uh, robustly. Um, but he can't sting me, and um, it's a nice uh, party trick to get people up close and personal uh, with bees. They actually will um, stay there. They can be held for uh, a minute or so, and um, they'll kind of calm down, and then you can pet them, and they might buzz for you. So my uh, professional goal is to get more amateur and professional uh, scientists excited about bees and other pollinators. Uh, whether that's through programs, resources, activities, um, trying to get more advocates out there in the field. And, and sometimes, as I said, it's like getting up close and personal. Um, this is Brenda. She's in, uh, involved with some community food projects in uh, Cleveland. And she came out to OARDC, where my office is based, um, to, uh, to do a research trip to see what kinds of things are happening there on campus. 
And uh, we went out in uh, the pollinator gardens with nets and captured some bees along with her, um, her uh, associates who came down that day. And uh, it kind of sparked for Brenda some memories of being in her grandmother's garden with a butterfly net uh, and um, enjoying that from, um, from, from childhood. So some cool ways to get people connected to uh, the world around them. Here's a project that, a project that we're um, just starting. Actually, we just launched this in the last week. Um, this is a Chadwick Arboretum, which is on the OSU campus in Columbus. Um, Chadwick has an area they call the Arboretum North. It's 250 pretty um, undeveloped acres. That is not formal garden uh, acres. They have a, a three acre research lake. They have a native tree collection and a, a number of other collections, um, but it's more of a natural space, um, especially for us as Arboretum go. Uh, but they, they want to follow um, the teachings of Doug Tallamy and others talking about um, creating a living landscape. And so the, the, they already have some pollinator plantings and other uh, plantings that favor um, uh, all the creatures. And so um, now they're trying to look at, okay, who do we have here on the grounds and how do we kind of expand that. So the bio inventory uh, project was developed and this is great because it can be something you do socially distanced, right? You can go by yourself, the campus is still open um, or with a, a friend and comb through taking observations, pictures of any creature that you see there uh, in the Arboretum North. Um, at the time that we started this, uh, this survey last uh, week, there were only 64 species that had been observed on uh, in this part of the, the Arboretum. So that tells me we just haven't been looking, right? There haven't been uh, a lot of people out there taking observations. So we're kind of building that, um, that, that look at the diversity of Arboretum North. And then from there, we'll kind of, um, kind of focus on what areas can be developed and what should be the sustainable landscape practices to help build the diversity there on the, on the campus. So I know it's far for, um, for all of us in Northeast Ohio um, to get down there, but just as an example of a kind of project that you could undertake, it's fairly easy to set up your own project on iNaturalist and to train volunteers. There are a lot of really great training materials through iNaturalist and um, you, know, you can have people out there um, helping you figure out what, um, what's on the, um, the park or natural area. So uh, we did kick off the, um, the Ohio Bee Survey this year. So this is a two-year study uh, where we have community um, observers, bee observers, uh, and collectors across the state. We have actually collectors in every county in Ohio, which was um, an, an interesting uh, uh, struggle to make sure we had all counties uh, represented. And so folks are um, going out, this is a lethal uh, study, so they're putting out bee bowls once a week and collecting uh, bees and um, what we call bycatch, anybody else who comes in the bowl, uh, which will then be pinned and identified to kind of create that list of who is um, in Ohio, what are the bee species that we have. Um, so I did want to, I forgot to press my, uh, my chat button, let me do that because I put all these links up here uh, for you. There, so you should now have a link to um, all the things I'm talking about, um, including the, um, the OSU B Lab. So I'm uh, part of the B Lab, uh, which is a, um, a, a group through Ohio State working out of all of our campuses to focus on bees and other pollinators. So on our website, um, you can click on any of these, um, uh, these tabs to get more information on, for example, native bee uh, identification or a plant list for Ohio and um, in the Midwest. Um, here on Ohio links, I'm gonna click forward um, to show you I have a link that shows all of our OSU fact sheets and bulletins. So we have quite a few resources out there. Uh, these are all available as PDFs, so you can download them, um, use them, you know, access them for, uh, for programs and events. Uh, and I'll bring to your attention, we have a new item, this Bees of Ohio, a field guide. Um, so this is a new publication that just uh, came out a couple weeks ago based on a, a Maryland book, a Maryland field guide. Um, uh, so we uh, updated this for Ohio, put in the Ohio species that we know um, with some really wonderful images. You can see the sample page there 
on the right how to tell some of the bee genera um, apart and um, some basic information like history, natural history about those species so you can use this uh, to figure out who you've got uh, in front of you. Um, another thing I have indexed there on that uh, page is um, our bee poster. So if you're in a, uh, a nature center or a school setting, we do have a lot of resources. We have a bee card, uh, which is available as a pre free PDF. Um, and this is a poster based on the bee card, but it's something you could print in a larger size uh, for educational displays. And then like many of you, um, I've uh, turned um, to the computer this spring um, instead of a lot of outreach that I had planned, I had actually three cohorts of, of um, educational outreach programs that were beginning in uh, February. Um, and so because of COVID-19, those went to an online course on the, um, the eCampus, the eExtension campus, which is a, a national forum for online courses through Extension. So we now have a pollinator course. Um, this is, was open to my outreach participants. So we had about 130 folks who spent eight weeks together learning about pollinators. Um, my goal was then to transition this course into something that others could, um, could take, could sign up and take and um, be able to get CE or a certificate uh, through this. One of the cool things we have going right now is after our eight week program ended online, uh, we had a study group that started. So we have one study group that's going to learn about bees, um, another that's focused on observing nature, like this bumblebee nest that someone found um, in their raised bed yesterday and sent me a picture. Um, but we're also doing a nature's best hope study group. And so if you've read Doug Tallamy, you know that's his new title. And we're focusing on then those, those tenants, what we're calling the Tallamy tenants of um, management strategies and techniques that we can use in our own landscapes to favor pollinators, birds, and um, all other creatures. So I'll end up with uh, the, the point that I like to make to folks is the, um, you know, try to do one thing. It can be kind of overwhelming if we think, you know, should I plant my whole backyard? I don't have five acres. How can I uh, take all these steps that help pollinators and other um, living things? But even if we do one thing, right, we plant a uh, mountain mint in our garden this year. We um, help a neighbor learn about the million pollinator challenge. Um, one thing can really make a big difference. And then there's my contact information, my email, and uh, blab.osu.edu. So thank you very much for the chance to um, share some of what I do. I'd be happy to answer any questions that might come up. Thank you, Denise. Uh, Denise has given us a lot of websites and resources, and I will be sending those out. And also, I'll be creating a blog with the presentations and answers to questions and resources. Laura, do we have anything else in the chat box? Sorry, I was muted. Sandy Barbic um, from Summit Soil and Water Conservation has let us know that the Michigan State Lab is open for soil testing. Um, the Ohio, lab is not open currently, it's not taking um, samples. And then I don't see any specific questions about Denise's presentation just yet. Uh, somebody was asking to have the link sent to them, which, we, which you already just mentioned. Um, so if anybody else has any questions for Denise, now's the time. Okay, well, we're going to turn it over to Amy Ross Kelly now, and I have her presentation. And there is a concern that Amy can't stick to her time. So uh, I will on, do man. my best to keep her on track. Uh, I have one quick question for Denise that just came through. Denise, okay. are you still there? Yes, it I is. am. It is, are carpenter bees destructive? Um, I would take up all of Amy's time if we started on carpenter bees, but let me tell you that they are, they are native pollinators. So if you can tolerate them without them being in your house or your porch railing or your Adirondack chair, um, they're good to leave alone. But I also feel that they're not compatible with structures. Um, they can do a lot of damage. And so there are some you know, responsible ways to, uh, to control slash kill them. 
um, but not uh, harm other, other bees or pollinators. I will say too, just real quick, we had an infestation in our chicken coop and had to replace the roof because of them. But when we took the roof off, there were all kinds of native leaf cutter bees that had <clears throat> used the old channels of the carpenter bees um, for their nest too. So uh, it was, you know, we rescued, we took them all out and put them in a separate thing and hopefully we'll get those to hatch. So they, uh, you know, they can be beneficial in that way. They make little channels for other, for other bees to use. Okay, thank you, Denise. And now we're gonna turn it over to Amy Ross Kelly. Amy is with Cuyahoga Soil and Water Conservation District, and mm -hmm. she's gonna answer a couple questions for us. Amy? All right, just waiting for my presentation to come up. Isn't it up? Nope, there it is. Okay, okay, so as Kathy mentioned, um, I'm Amy with the Cuyahoga Soil and Water Conservation District. Again, thank you, Kathy, for organizing this, and happy Pollinator Week to everybody. Um, I'm going to bring it home into your backyard because a lot of times we talk about going native, and um, it's really hard sometimes to do that because there's tons of lists out there of what native plants are and what you should put in your yard or what we want you to put in your yard, but what are they and how do you get that? Next slide. So a little bit about me, um, I've been a beekeeper for about 12 years or so. I recently got out of it um, two years ago, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, but I am endlessly fascinated with all pollinators, but particularly honeybees and all different types of bees. Um, I'm a photographer as well, so I try to capture the different things that bees are doing. On the right side, you'll see um, those bees with interlocking legs, and they're festooning, so they're trying to fill the space between uh, the two frames that I had out at the time, they're worker bees. So they want to fill that space and start building a uh, comb and filling it up. So they were not happy with me to have that out there, but I caught this really cool image of them doing this practice. So endlessly fascinated by bees, uh, particularly honey bees. Again, I kept them for about 12 years on and off. Um, but next slide, we'll show you why I got out of it. Because of this jerk. So this jerk has a super cool name. This is Varroa Destructor. It is a mite that is responsible for the destruction of a lot of honeybee hives. It's not the only reason, um, but the Varroa mite uh, will in infest hives, particularly in the late fall and into the winter when the hive starts reducing down um, and it will destroy a hive. I know it destroyed many of my hives. And the reason I got out of beekeeping was because the recommended treatment for the Varroa mite was more intense than I wanted to do. So I got out of it um, and decided to concentrate mostly on habitat in my yard. Uh, next slide. But before we get into that, another thing I learned is, you know, over the years is that, and, and a lot of you already know this, but honeybees are, um, they're part of agriculture. And they are, this is, this is a whole other presentation in itself, but honeybees are literally put on semi trucks and driven all across the country through the spring and summer and to pollinate our crops. So they are, it's not a, I don't believe it's a very sustainable way to pollinate our crops, um, but unfortunately this is the way that it happens um, in the United States and probably in other countries. Um, so I kind of came to the realization that uh, keeping honeybees, to me, is, you're not saving the bees if you're keeping honeybees. Um, there's, there's bees out there, they're used for agriculture. You're learning about bees. Yes, you are contributing to pollination. Um, but for me, it was a big decision to get out of, of keeping honeybees. I still miss them desperately. But again, I decided to concentrate more on the habitat in my yard to invite all those pollinators, including honeybees and other native bees, into my yard. Next slide. Okay, so this is what I would love to see in everybody's yard, is all of these beautiful pollinator habitats, very wild. Um, this is my, totally my type of garden. Um, however, as I talk to people across the county, I've literally been told by people that um, that looks too messy, or what, which I get, or it looks too, I'm sorry, the one I wanted to say was it looks too natural. Somebody told me that goldenrod looks too natural, which I had to resist rolling my eyes into the back of my head, but I get it, because sometimes you live in neighborhoods that have HOAs or picky neighbors or something that want things to look neat and orderly. So next one. This is exactly what we don't want to see. 
Um, although we have seen this in a lot of places, you see uh, a big, uh, big part of uh, all this grass right here. And if you garden like a bee or you think like a bee or any other type of pollinator, this is not what you want. Um, this would be the equivalent of me and a friend going on a road trip um, across from Ohio to California. And there are no restaurants, there's no gas stations, and about every 100 miles or so we have to drink some poison. So that's not a very successful road trip. And for a bee, that's the same equivalent of a bee traveling across this type of landscape, which has no food, no shelter, and then probably laced with a lot of chemicals on this lawn to keep it that lush green, quote unquote, perfect um, lawn. So not healthy for, um, for bees or any other type of pollinators. So what we want people to do is meet in the middle. Try not to have that big yard that has no, no habitat whatsoever. And if you can't have the big wild yard, you can somehow meet in the middle there by just taking up a little bit of your habitat each year. Um, I have to rent my house. Um, I don't own it. And my landlords have been like, eh, do whatever you want. So I keep on taking up the yard until they tell me not to. So far they haven't said anything, so that's good. Next one. So last year, um, I had no garden space left. There's a lot of other gardens around, but this one on the left was 2019. I started taking up some of it and then uh, planted some native plants there, which in 2020 on the right side, you can see the very poorly drawn triangles. Um, and the upper part was the 2019 plants growing up really beautiful. There wasn't a big space, just maybe about 50 square feet. And then this year I said, no more plants. Um, and then someone said, do you want some plants? And I said, I will take plants. So that's, I have a problem. So I took up this other part of my yard and made this nice arc in the backyard where I don't have much grass left, just enough for my hammock. And uh, then planted those, as, uh, planted more plants in there this spring. Next one. I do keep a list of all the plants in my yard and when they bloom. And you'll notice on here I say native-ish because I do, you don't kick me out of the group, but I do have a couple plants in my yard that are not native, like daylilies and poker plants. The daylilies came, they were here when I moved in and I just haven't gotten around to digging them up yet. They don't really provide a whole lot. Um, I have a poker plant, which is not native, um, but my neighbor actually ran it over with the car so it hasn't bloomed in years, but it's a beautiful plant and it doesn't spread. So anything that I will invite into my yard is not something that would spread and take over. I have about a million more plants than what is on this list here. This list is several years old, but I try to keep track of everything that's blooming in my yard, the date that it starts to bloom, and have something that blooms from the first part of the spring until the very last part of the fall. And over here on the right, you see a nice little, um, I think that's a bumblebee there, uh, with awesome pollen on her back leg and her pollen basket or corbicula, and she is getting some pollen there from one of my coreopsis plants. Next slide. So I'm um, going to tell you about some about six or seven different plants that I have in my yard that you may or may not be familiar with, but that are native here to this region. Uh, the first one is Ohio spiderwort, and I have the dates on there because I want you to, I keep track, and I would love it if you guys did this too, it's a great way to become familiar with your yard, is I keep track and I take pictures of everything in my yard, <clears throat> excuse me, when it starts to come up, when it starts to get leaves on it, when it blooms, and when it starts to die back. Ohio spiderwort is one of the first ones that comes up. Um, it goes to about two or three feet. It blooms from May through July. And full sun to part shade, I will say it does appreciate full sun much more than part shade. So if I were making this list, I would change it to full sun because my one in part shade is only about half blooming right now. Um, Ohio spiderwort, after it's done blooming, it tends to lay down. Um, so what I've done, uh, as I learned that, what I've done is planted some plants around it so that will take up that space as Ohio spiderwort kind of dies back. And I'm not going to say the Latin names because I don't want to embarrass myself. Next one. Okay, I am a little bit of an emotional gardener. So um, when I saw Rattlesnake Master, I had no idea about what this plant looked like. I just like the name because that is one, you know what name, it's so cool. Um, and I like any type of plant. So that's Rattlesnake Master on about April 11th, uh, just coming up. But you can see I haven't cleaned the debris out of my yard yet, uh, which I wait a long time to do, as long as I possibly can, because I know there's a lot of critters in there who are making their habitat and having their babies and need time to emerge out. Um, but then around July or so, it, June or July, it starts to get these awesome white 
uh, spiky ball flowers that pollinators absolutely love. And it's not just bees, it's all different things I see landing on this. Uh, Rattlesnake Master, again, likes full sun. Uh, that one I've definitely seen enjoys the sun. It's not too happy in the shade. Although it will grow, it just doesn't grow quite as big. Next one. Culver's root is one of my favorite. Um, I don't know, I think the flowers are just beautiful on it. They're these like um, spiky, beautiful white flowers. And I will say it attracts bumblebees like crazy. Bumblebees are all over this. And Culver's root, it's really filled in this space nicely. Um, that was on May 22nd on the left there when it started to come up. And then obviously it's not July yet. So that was July of last year, the year before. You can see a bumblebee on there just hanging out. Um, it blooms June through August, uh, dies back nicely, comes back every year, definitely wants full sun. I finally moved the last of it that was in a part shade area and moved it over into full sun and it has totally grown up way more than it was last year. Um, keep in mind, you've seen these markers on the plants here. The uh, culver's root, I'm sorry, the, the markers are from a place called Everlast Pawpaw. Um, labels. They're up in Michigan. I learned about them through our Master Rain Gardeners program. Um, so they order them. They're relatively inexpensive. They come to you really quick. Make sure you get the marking pen with them. Um, I don't remember what I planted because usually I'm like fall in love with the plant at the store and then bring it home and plant it and I never remember what it is. So just being honest with you there. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, common milkweed, Asclepias syriaca. See, I know how to say that one. So uh, common milkweed in my garden, I'm always like, come on, I know you can come back up. Uh, it's one of the last ones to come back up. It took me about two years to get this patch started. Um, I had seeds and then I finally got some plants. I wasn't having any luck, but once it starts, it goes. And it's now spreading into my yard and into those silly bushes next to the common milkweed. It's kind of grown up in the middle of those, which I like. Um, it's almost blooming right now. I'd say everything in my yard is about two weeks behind that it was last year, which is an interesting exercise to, um, to kind of mark down when everything blooms in your yard to compare different years. So next one. So common milkweed is so cool that it deserves two, two slides. Uh, common milkweed smells delicious. And I know that's not the word I'm supposed to use, but it's right outside my door when I walk out and I just jam my nose right into it and smell it because it smells so good, so ridiculously good. It attracts everything, bumblebees, flies, honeybees, um, birds, everything kind of lands on there. Uh, of course it is the host to the monarch butterfly and you see on the bottom left-hand corner there is a monarch egg. Um, I have only found one caterpillar because I'm pretty sure there's some other critters in there who are feasting on the eggs and feasting on the caterpillars, which I just kind of let them do their thing. Um, but I'd like to see some, some uh, chrysalis on there, but I haven't quite seen that yet, so. Next one. Okay, Amy, I'm just gonna let you know we are at time. Well, all right, I got a little more to go. So give me five more minutes. Uh, we barely have five more minutes and we need time for questions. Okay, all right, well keep going and then I will go real fast. Okay, butterfly weed, also a host for, um, for uh, the monarch butterfly, another great one to have in your yard, beautiful color. Next one. Next slide. Blazing Star, one of my favorites, another beautiful one. You guys are gonna get all these slides, so I won't explain all of them, but this is a beautiful one to add some contrast into your yard. Next slide. And then don't forget about your annuals, uh, uh, planting sunflowers. Uh, you get tons of bees coming in, tons of birds that feed on the sunflowers as well. I have sunflowers just around the corner from my milkweed. So they're feeding over there and then laying their eggs on the milkweed. Next one. Uh, we can pass this one. We've done this one before. Okay, so I love to hold bumblebees and other types of bees. You can get them early in the morning when they're kind of groggy and a little bit dewy. And it's a great way to become um, familiar with what types of pollinators you have in your yard. Um, they'll let you do this like Denise was holding a bumblebee. They'll let you do this for a little bit and then kind of fly off and be like, what the heck was that? Um, but it's, it's kind of fun to do that early in the morning. Next one. 
All right, so where do you find these? Um, I can send you an, a big list of ones, but Avalon Gardens is one of my favorite. They're out in Chardon. Um, there's a whole list of other ones there. Don't be afraid of the big box stores. That The picture on the right is um, half off plants I got in the fall. Peggy mentioned planting in the fall. Um, half off plants, because people don't want the ones that don't look perfect. Plan what you want and call first. If you're going out to Avalon Gardens, that's 45 minutes from my house. So I made sure they had Blazing Star before I went out there. Next one. Um, of course, there's a lot of ones coming up at Metro Parks, Soil and Water Conservation Districts. Go early to plant sales because you may not be, they may be sold out by the time you get there. I think we just have a couple more, Kathy. Okay, so as mentioned before, we do sell native plant kits. Our order deadline is July 17th. They're shipped around Labor Day. If you don't need 50 plants in the kit, uh, you can split them with a friend, which is how I got roped into getting more plants. Uh, I made a list of all of the plants in the kits and their height, spread, bloom time, bloom color, all of that for your convenience. Next one. Uh, we sell seeds year round. Uh, with everybody being quarantined, a lot of people are gardening. Last year we sold 70s, some packs of seeds. And this year we've already sold well over 120 seeds, I think. So people are in their gardens. Next one. And that's it. So uh, check out our website. That's my yard after everything has been uh, planted in this year. It's growing up nicely. That was just a few days ago. Feel free to check out our website and all of the plant sales and seed sales are on there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Laura, do we have any questions? We just had, uh, people were curious about where to find the plant labels and somebody did a quick search. Amber did a quick search and found everlastlabel.com. That's it. Thank you, Amber. Make sure you get the pen with it too to mark those. Oh, and she, Lisa said, if not upcoming, add cup plant. Cup plant, you saw a couple of those that were laying on the ground. A uh, cup plant can get up to about 15 feet or so. It can get a little crazy. So my cup plant had a ton of babies this year and I had to split that because it was hanging over onto my neighbor's car. Uh, so my neighbors are happier. It's a little bit, uh, it's, you know, it's a little bit more under control this year, but you got to really think about where you're going to put these plants in your yard. But cup plant is a cool one. If, uh, people are asking if, if we like bone set as a plant, and I think Amber can confirm that one of the bone sets are Joe pie weeds or um, iron weeds, things that look like that, that have many flowers on them are really great for pollinators later in the season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know in terms of our native plants, is there such thing as a bad one we don't like? It's all about the right plant in the right place. Um, and so, you know, not everything is necessarily going to be garden friendly. Some get a bit more, uh, you could say, aggressive. They get happier in some places and tend to spread more. Um, so you definitely need to think about the, the size of the habitat you have and um, think a few years in advance what this might turn into when putting things in and make sure that you have room to spread. Or if you don't want things that spread, um, just focus on species that behave themselves a little bit more. Um, so no, no bad native plants, just need to make sure that they fit your uh, needs and desires. And that's why I made that chart because I wanted people in the time that they order the kit, before they get their kit, they can plan out their garden of where everything goes and they didn't put an aster in the front of their garden like I did that buried everything in the back part of the garden. It is now moved. Um, somebody mentioned shade is more difficult to find. Um, there are shade plants. We have a shade plant kit that we're selling. We also have a Mesic Woodland uh, uh, seed pack that we sell through OPN Seed um, that's good for shady areas. So you can, you can do a shade garden for sure. And Lisa wants us all to remember that the Wilderness Center has a wonderful yes. native plant sale. I got some awesome plants there this year. Highly recommend and go down, get your plants, take a lovely hike on their beautiful property. It is a wonderful asset in our region so make sure you check that out and lisa i believe uh we do have that on our every year we add to our native plant sale list when those plant sales come live and have, we have put those on there so we're not we're not ignoring you i swear <laughs> and in the chats i did list um a link to the the leap the lake erie allegheny partnership um they have a native plant nursery map um so i did put that link out there and uh also 
There's uh, some great uh, plant guides that are regional for um, your eco regions and everything through Pollinator Partnership. And I put those out there as well to help with some of those plant list possibilities as well. Give you some good info on the growing conditions, light preference and things like that. Okay. You can also put, up some, put up some labels in the chat as well. So we'll be able to send out those links to everybody. Okay, so I'd like to thank all of our speakers today for kicking off National Pollinator Week. Thank you, Laura, for taking care of the chat box for us. <laughs> um, and as we've mentioned, I'll be reaching out to all of you with resources and I'll create a blog on sustainablecleveland.org where we can put all the presentations and resources for all of you to share. And with that, Thanks, Kathy. Happy Pollinator Week. Thank you, Kathy. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great week, everybody.